be scared. Beep. I shall not be, be scared. Boop. Boop. I'm afraid! Ah! Jake, get me out of the water! Now, Jake, now! Now! Ah! Hot jam! You're really scared of the ocean. In fact, you're so scared, it gives me an idea. Let's start a business of being scared of the ocean! Jake! Okay, okay. Hey everybody, my name is Julian. Welcome to Half Blast Gaming. Yay. <laughs> and uh, as always, I got my my ragtag bunch of rambunctious mystery solvers. Uh, Mandy, why don't you introduce yourself first? Hi. Yes, well actually I guess I introduced you and you just responded. I did. I will do the same for Josh. That's me, I'm just Josh. Just Josh. All the time? I'm I'm never not Josh. Good point. And of course, just really looking quite lovely today. Rev. It, it is true. I am looking quite lovely. I decided to uh, go with some black lipstick because I'm feeling my inner goth today. Mm -hmm. Got a little bit of a semi-crow thing going on. Right? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's happening? Cool. Uh, we got to get an impression? No, the other day um, uh, we were in a, in a coffee shop and Mandy's like, there's a list of movies that if someone says this is their favorite movie that I will judge them. And I was like hoping for a list of like a hundred movies. Yeah. And she had like three and <laughs> one of them was The Crow. Oh, what? You judge them <laughs> negatively? If it's their favorite movie of all time. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, that's fair. Like, I feel like The Crow is a legitimately good movie mm -hmm. for, you know, the time it came out mm -hmm. and, and what it is. But I, yeah, favorite of all time. I'm, I'm, yeah. Well, see, I was talking to Josh about how Devil's Night mm -hmm. is only a thing in Detroit, Michigan, with it, which is the area I grew up in. But I didn't know that it was only a thing there. Mm -hmm. uh, Devil's Night is the day before Halloween, and it's associated with like acts of violence, arson, uh, murder attacks, and like there'd be stuff on the news about like not going out on Devil's Night. And I just thought that was everywhere, mm. but apparently it wasn't. But I mean, like it's it's the central plot point for the crow is Devil's Night. So mm -hmm. I just assumed. I had no reason to think that this wasn't a thing anywhere. I guess I, watching The Crow, never really thought, you know, where does this exist other than Detroit? I thought it was a completely fictional thing. Mm. See, I, I knew it was a Detroit thing. I assumed there was some other big cities that did something like that. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was just a Detroit thing. Yeah. Well, they like to lose themselves in the moment, the music. <sighs> It's not, not the best part of so that movie. So what are the other two? Oh, I don't want to say people will get mad at me because they're, <laughs> they're, they're well-liked movies. Come on. Uh, you've got Mail. Oh, fuck that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know, but the other one is like the most well-liked movie of all time. Forrest Gump? No. Uh, I hate Forrest Gump, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. But I do. <laughs> no, and I like this movie for the record, but it's the Shawshank Redemption ah, because yeah. it's like the most cliche favorite movie of all time. I dislike uh, The Green Mile more than I do Shawshank I, I don't dislike Shawshank. It's just... It's the mode. It's like the most generic favorite mm -hmm. movie of all time. Mm -hmm. No, it, it, uh, it's a really good movie. It's just the type of person who's like, "What is my favorite movie?" And they look at Rotten Tomatoes and find the highest rated movie, and like, <laughs> "Okay, that's my favorite." Yeah, it, it, I like that movie. Yeah, it must be my favorite. Yeah, I, I also uh, drink PBR and I like <laughs> Mario. <laughs> I, I feel much the same way, except about Citizen Kane. Because like it's it's less modern, so the people who say that's my favorite movie, they they're doing the exact same thing, but they're trying to be pretentious about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a good movie though. It, it is right. It's it is a, a really good movie. Good movie. <laughs> um, but it also like changed cinema forever. Mm -hmm. Right. No, it's it's legitimately one of the best movies of all time. Like legitimately. Yeah. So and and also something can be the best like one of the best of all time, but still not be someone's favorite. That's true. I um, Actually, when Napoleon Dynamite originally came out, uh, we didn't know what the hell it was. We went to go see it in the theater. And in fact, there was like a couple on a date. Um, I think there was three of us that went, this couple on a date, maybe one or two other people in the theater. Um, and the couple on the date, I mean, they left almost instantaneously. It was like, they were not having it. Right? <laughs> we were like, this movie's fucking great. You know, we were smoking weed and it's funny. And then it blew up and became the most annoying thing possibly of that time period. It's like a cake is a lie. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, but it's like the, legitimately liking that movie for whatever reason 
And then all of a sudden now it's like everybody's got to vote for Pedro shirt on. And it's just like this huge cake is a lie, kitschy bandwagon bullshit thing. And It was genuinely a great movie that didn't try to be, you know, something amazing. And it just, it like, it felt so, so genuine and so off the wall at the same time that it was a really fun movie. I was working for a health food company at the time Napoleon Dynamite came out and I overheard this person trying to describe the plot of Napoleon Dynamite (laughs) in the most pretentious possible way. So it like would sound like some art film and they're like, it's about this conservative isolated town and like a young Hispanic boy moves there and is discriminated against by his classmates and he decides to run for student government against the popular Caucasian students, but he manages to win. It's like, it's, it's, I mean, it is, it is the plot yeah. of Napoleon Dead Rage, but it's not really, it was so funny, like, him trying to justify liking this movie to his pretentious friends by giving such a misleading description of the plot. I mean, if you, if that was like, you're like, oh yeah, I want to see this, this intellectual film mm-hmm. and you like go into it and like, <laughs> yeah. that's your... Like, I just, I wonder what your takeaway would be. Yeah, like, it's like, I totally love Citizen Kane, so this sounds right <laughs> up <my> alley. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, we, we've gotten into some movies, but uh, anybody been watching TV lately? I, uh, I've i been watching a lot of Netflix, because uh, we just, we never watch television. We just, we have the internet. Yeah, no, I think um, when, when people nowadays say they watch TV, I think you'd be surprised if they actually meant cable television. It's gotten to this point. You know, I have a PS4, so I have a television. Right. Um, and I do some of my Netflixing on there when I'm lazy. Uh, but I have been spending a lot of time on Netflix watching uh, the uh, new Who. I Because I've seen some episodes, like at the gym, uh, the BBC America plays it right at the time when I'm, I'm working out at the gym. Mm-hmm. So I've seen some sporadic episodes. I'm like, you know, I've never seen an Eccleston episode. So I just started watching from the beginning, and now I'm, you know, halfway through the first season of Tenant's Run, mm-hmm. because you can't stop watching Doctor Who, apparently. Mm. Unless you're recording a podcast. Unless you're recording a podcast. Unless you're but actually, watching it now. I totally am. Oh I've got a chip God. in my head that's <laughs> running through Doctor Who. Mm. You've got the Who chip. Yeah. I've got the Who chip. Reverend, I, here's a Who. I saw I saw a, a, a PSA about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just started watching uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It's an alright program, I mean. But just last night, I began watching the Minority Report TV show. <laughs> I haven't seen the show, but uh, the the original short story, Minority Report, was written by uh, Phil K. Dick, who's yeah. one of my favorite authors. Oh, yeah. Well, and then they have the Tom Cruise movie. Yeah. You know, but uh, this one, it's not bad. It's just got the worst uh, setup introduction I think I've seen in a very long time. It's like they introduced the precogs as kids, and they had some birth defects, and now they're given something, and they're kids, but they can do things. And so they're in the room, and they're like, blue, 51, something. And they're showing all these flashcards that people are looking at. They're like, wow, they can see the flashcards. And then all of a sudden, they're like, it's a murder. Oh, no, turn around. It's like, <laughs> what a great There show. was one side effect. They could see murders. It's like, <laughs> what? But, but only murders. They can't see any other crime. Yeah, it's like. They don't just see murders. Theft. They don't see theft. You know what I mean? It's like just <laughs> fucking murders. It was like so ridiculous. I couldn't believe that they actually were trying to say, hey, this is legitimate, right? The the other television show that I watch, uh, Steven Universe, which each episode is like 11 minutes long. Of course. It's a story about, you know, some magic aliens that are agendered space rocks that are, you know, protecting people from humanity, from monsters and whatever. But there's also a lot of really entertaining social stuff in there. Mm. You know, like one of the uh, characters winds up being a magical fusion of two other characters who are fused all the time because they are in that kind of relationship and they just want to be together and that's a way that these alien beings can be together. Mm -hmm. Uh, But of course that means that you can now describe uh, the character Garnet as a big lesbian made up of two smaller lesbians, Mm -hmm. which is a really entertaining thing to say. So Mm -hmm. I say it every chance I get. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, I have a problem with television because i have a i have a degree in literature and i you know i wrote about video games for a living for you know three or four years 
And so, like, I prioritize my entertainment by, like, video games come first because it's for my job. Mm -hmm. Then books come next because it's, you know, what I have a degree in. After that is movies. And then after that is TV. Mm -hmm. And so I almost never get to TV because I'm so busy with the the other things. And on top of, you know, the other things I'm involved in, like, it's just – and when I watch it, when I, like, get into a good TV show, I'll just binge Mm -hmm. and then, like, lose, like, a week of my life. And, like, it's like, oh, man, I watched, you know. I watched Breaking Bad in like four days, Mm -hmm. but like I know going into a TV show that that's always a danger. And so that's another thing that keeps me from watching TV. Maybe, maybe if you watched like a little at a time spread out when the show first comes out, uh, you won't binge watch like an alcoholic. I don't know. I don't like to watch TV that way. Like Mm -hmm. I want, you know, the best TV is like one big serialized story Mm -hmm. and I like to just experience the whole story and then you know, be like, oh, yeah, that one thing relates to that one thing from five seasons ago. And I actually notice it because I didn't watch them five years apart. I watched them two days apart. Yeah, that's how I feel about episodic gaming. I hate playing it and then really being hooked. And then you have to wait for who knows how long. I liked Waiting for Life is Strange, actually. I feel like it was well designed. But like The Wolf Among Us, if if I had not played it all at once, I probably would have just only played the first chapter Mm -hmm. and given up. It's not it's not structured for speculation in the same way that Life is Strange is. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say Arrow was a fantastic show. Those abs. Yeah, hey, ho, hey, whoa. Let's just end this episode right now and fast forward to our Stephen M. L. Ab episode. I think. <laughs> <laughs> we all have deep contemplative thoughts about those puppies. Uh, I'm busy thinking about them right now. Yeah, boy, what I wouldn't do to scrub a T-shirt on that. <laughs> <laughs> Really do some laundry on those abs. Yes, laundry. Mandy? I don't really watch that much TV anymore. Mm -hmm. The type of TV I really like is like really involving and super serialized and like everything's really connected. And Mm. so you have to like watch them close together and pay a lot of attention. And I don't really watch TV that way anymore. Mm -hmm. Like the times I want to watch TV are like when I feel super sick or like I'm too tired to do anything else. So I watch like cartoons Mm -hmm. and nature documentaries. Mm -hmm. What animals? Yes, the the nature documentaries are about animals, Josh. <laughs> and then you're like, whatever animal is on the nature documentary, and you're like, I wonder if they make a dress with that print. <laughs> Except if it's a centipede. No, I mean, when I look for a nature documentary, I'm really looking for an animal I just like to look at. I don't even necessarily care if I learn anything. I just, I want to chill out and look at cute or cool looking things. Uh, I watch a lot of underwater documentaries because there's so many things I don't usually get to look at. For there was a long time where I was obsessed with this documentary that was just people scuba diving with manta rays. And I mean, it was practically just a screensaver. It was just mostly footage of people swimming next to manta rays. <laughs> but it was really relaxing and really pretty and really cool. I just, I just like underwater stuff, any underwater stuff. As long as it's not video game stuff, right? Because underwater stuff is the worst. No, I love underwater video games. Yes. I hate underwater levels. Objection. Uh, so we're going to take a break. Of course, you know, I'd like to thank uh, 2XAA and Wheelie for the music. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, Aaron Voltenson for uh, all of the fantastic art. Uh, obviously, we're all over the internet these days. For old time's sakes, you can find us at uh, our site, halfglassgaming.com. You can find us on uh, retrovolve.com and uh, stick around and read a couple articles or two and, uh, you know, leave some comments and, and whatever else. Uh, the Retrovolve community is really uh, thriving right now. So yeah. if, if you want to be a part of that, you know, jump in and say some stuff and yeah. meet some people. Well, we're going to take a break. Um, but when we come back, we're going to be underwater. Our ears are going to be wet. All right, we're back. I'm still dry and I'm a little concerned. So we're going to talk about underwater, not skimming the surface where you're power boarding over water via Ninja Turtles, but we actually go under <laughs> via Ninja via Turtles. Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> water levels are usually frustrating for people, I think. It's like the one level that as soon as you 
figure out you're going to be underwater, you're kind of just like, shit. You're going along, and you're playing the game, Mm -hmm. and you're spending the game a few levels, a few dungeons, whatever, getting used to the game physics, getting used to how things work, and then suddenly, boom, water level. The physics are entirely different. Uh, It's it's exactly the same reason ice levels are annoying. They change the physics on you, and you're trying to figure shit out Mm -hmm. on the run. Mm. I mean, that's actually a really good point, because, like... Typically in like a good, you know, let's say platformer, what a good platformer does is slowly teaches you the physics, you know, or the the mechanics one at a time, and then uses all of those mechanics to work together, you know, in a game, even in Mario or, you know, in Sonic the Hedgehog Mm -hmm. or in, you know, Mega Man, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Shovel Knight even, the physics change for that one level yeah, in, in like the case of a Mario game, the the level that has, you know, three or four different iterations as you go through the game. The thing is, the underwater mechanics don't typically stack with other mechanics, and so it's like, okay, how can we use underwater mechanics to, you know, offset or to work together with or to play with these other mechanics in a way that makes it meaningful for you to have to learn those mechanics over mm-hmm. again. Uh, I think in like the Mega Man games, it's, it's like a cheap trick to be like, oh, there's spikes on the ceiling, but if you jump, you're going to jump all the way to the top because you're underwater. Or like, you know, Sonic the Hedgehog is like, his whole thing is like, he's going fast and then it's like, okay, but now you're underwater. So mm-hmm. you don't go fast and you can't breathe either. I think a, a perfect example of what you're talking about is Super Metroid. As soon as you get exposed to the underwater level, now it's like kind of everything that you've learned up to this point is out the window until you can acquire the, the purple suit and actually like regain your abilities. Uh, speaking of Ninja Turtles, in fact, mm-hmm. uh, the NES Ninja Turtles, uh, the underwater level was, you know, when you're trying to defuse bombs so they don't yeah. blow up the dam. Yeah. So not only are the physics entirely different, here's a really narrow pathway you have to take with like these electric plants on either side. And if you're not perfect, you're going to die. Where the hell were they? That there were electric plants everywhere underwater. Right? It's New York City, right? I mean, is that what New York City is like? <laughs> Just dumping into the water. I guess. If you're getting mutant turtles. That, now, that is a fair statement. For me, once realism started to kind of come into gameplay more, and you were actually able to, like, die when you were underwater, you couldn't just hold your breath forever. I mean, I guess Sonic did that a little bit. Yeah, Sonic had... So, like, not only were you not going fast anymore, but you had to constantly, like... Mm -hmm be on the lookout for those those little like bubbles that would come up mm-hmm. and so you would make the sound wah, wah, and yeah. you would like drink the bubble or whatever yeah so like in tomb raider and games like that where they would actually like suffocate and die i i absolutely do not want to drown that's like probably <laughs> my biggest not want to die way of dying is drowning i'm the kind of guy i'm like sweating while i'm playing those levels trying to fucking get up to the hole to get air and what have you i've been playing uh black ops 3 lately mm. for uh what i I understand the first time in Call of Duty history, they've integrated like swimming underwater into everything else. And so like you're playing like a multiplayer map and there's like an underwater tunnel. And if you can get through this underwater tunnel, you can like get to a different part of the map and things like that. And that's fully integrated into the rest of the game. And that's Mm -hmm. that's what I think a lot of like old retro games didn't do with water levels. It's like this is always separate. This is a separate thing from the rest of the game. And so it was frustrating because those mechanics didn't ever pay off. There was no payout for you learning those mechanics, except for that you got through the underwater level. Mm -hmm. Whereas like in Call of Duty Black Ops, it's different mechanics, obviously, because you're underwater. But you can use that to like as a new interesting way to get across terrain. Mm-hmm. There's like other new movement options. Like there's a wall run now, and all of a sudden your options for getting from point A to point B are like so varied. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh yeah, I can swim under this water and go through this tunnel, or I can like jump over this like outcropping of rocks and like do a wall run and like get over this cliff and things like that. And it's super fun Mm -hmm. well minecraft i use waterfalls as quick elevators we do that too yeah i i hear tell through the grapevine that mandy actually likes i love water levels levels. 
I don't like standard platformer physics that much. I'm just not good at it. I'm really bad at precise jumps. I don't have great spatial awareness. So I like the change of physics. It's generally much easier for me to get through a water level and pick up on those physics than Mm -hmm. it is in a standard platforming level. I really like underwater stuff in general. I like sea creatures. I like the ocean. When I was a kid in elementary school, one of my teachers made some offhand comment about, you know, all this money going into space exploration and we should be exploring the ocean and so like in my little child brain I just saw it as a competing thing like space or the ocean and I'm like well my side is ocean so screw you space and like (laughs) I decided I would be really into the ocean (laughs) and it kind of stuck yeah (laughs) <laughs> but I mean, I, I I like, like I was looking before we recorded this episode at a list of like worst underwater levels of all time. I'm like, I liked most of them. Mm-hmm. And I also like the Water Temple, which is probably the second most unpopular video game opinion what that game? I have. No, that's that's from Ocarina of Time. Yes. Which I hear uh, E.G. Ono... On- <laughs> Ideonoma uh, decided that that was why he would uh, remake the game was because of the water temple. No, he he wasn't happy with it. And I mean, in any underwater level, they're going to spend less time on the controls and the water level than they are in the rest of the game. And mm-hmm. so they didn't spend enough time and they wanted to make it more polished. But I do think the water temple gets some really unfair hate. I actually uh, didn't know this until recently, but Josh told me that there was a way that you could get stuck and not beat the water temple. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that, that can't be right. And so I looked it up and it's not right, but it's like a really common perception that you can just get stuck. Like people just don't understand how to approach the water temple. And so there are, there's a key that they miss. And so they think that if you don't get the keys in the right order, there's no way to beat the game. Mm. Puzzle solving in the Zelda games a lot of times is about finding this key getting into this room and that key that room has another key there was hypothetically a way you could get keys in an order that would keep you locked out from getting the rest of the keys Mm -hmm. and apparently that was that was just a rumor it wasn't actually a thing so what other examples uh, of awful uh, water levels did you come across on this list Uh, they were talking about the down the tubes level from earthworm gym Mm -hmm. which i think is so much fun i've saw people talking about super mario brothers uh turtles was on some lists and i think that's probably fair Mm -hmm. the only underwater level that i really do dislike is the one in Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Mm. which is really just go underwater and move as slowly as possible. And that's it. Like they just (laughs) made you move really slowly in some big clumsy scuba suit. And it's just super tedious. Mm -hmm. I do remember hating that, but they they were naming some really fun water levels, I thought. Was there a consensus on like that number one worst water level? No, I just looked at a couple of random lists quick. Mm -hmm. So if they're so unpopular and people hate them so very much. I mean, you hate them, right? I really hate underwater levels. Right. So 25% of this podcast really hates underwater levels. Well, I like the first time I played Shovel Knight, I stopped playing it because there was a water level and I was like, I... It's not worth it. It's not worth it to keep going to have to get through this this water level. I kept playing through the water level, but holy hell did I complain about it, like, constantly. Well, so if they have such hatred, the gaming community, people at large, men, women, children, grandparents, business people, politicians, if we all hate it so much... (laughs) Why are they so popular? Why do they continue? Well, not popular, I guess, but why are they still so prevalent? Why have they been a, a thing of gaming? I mean, I think part of it is just that for your standard platformer game, that Super Mario Brothers was so influential and mm-hmm. it used water levels. So, so many games were trying to build on what Super Mario Brothers did. The Super Mario Brothers isn't, you know, the first game to use a water level, but I think mm-hmm. it's the reason that it's considered a standard for mm-hmm. a certain type of platformer game. I mean, is it just a way to switch up the scenery even? Uh, yeah. I mean, well and I think that um, there's the old adage never attribute to malice what can be better attributed to stupidity and and I think that pretty much says why so many games still have underwater levels mm-hmm. because you know that's what you do. All right, so Mario we're, we're coming up, and... right? Mario did, or we're coming up with levels. How do what do we do? All right, well we'll do a fire level fire, and we'll do yeah. a, a desert level and we'll do an ice level and we'll have the water level and and you know they're just it's lazy design choice. Mm-hmm. Well, you it's gotta... like it's like one of the uh, you know the four elements like you know earth, wind, water, fire. Yeah. It's like you know there's going to be a fire level. There's going to be like Earth is what you stand on. Mm-hmm. There's going to be 
probably at like a cave level that has you yeah. go into the earth. Yeah. There's a pretty good chance there's going to be a wind level mm-hmm. where you're, you know, pushing against the wind, especially when you're talking about the Mega Man games. I can't defeat Airman. And so then you get you've got your like those are the basic level, and yeah. then you, then you like start iterating on those. Like okay, now, ice level, yeah, mm-hmm. let's do an ice level because we've got a fire level. Like mm-hmm. let's do an ice level, and then yeah. So basically, it's like just a bunch of developers. They just got done having their sexy Halloween costume meeting, and they figure okay, they just got well, done having their their weekly swim. Yeah, right. <laughs> They just they, came back from their love hotel, and uh, uh, they took some time to snort all the cocaine. All the cocaine, and they're like, "Look, we're lazy. Mario did it, assholes. Let's do what Mario did." I mean, I do think that part of why um, the Water Temple and Ocarina of Time got as much hate as it did is because traditionally, especially in like the 2D Zeldas, I can't speak much of the 3D Zeldas, uh, but in the 2D Zeldas, when they do a water dungeon. It's not very obnoxious. Mm -hmm. You know, like the water dungeon in Link to the Past, like it, you know, it involved figuring out how to raise and lower the water, but you didn't have any weird physics or mechanics. It was just another dungeon with some water themes. Uh, the, the water dungeon from, uh, Link's Awakening, like you were underwater some, but it gave you a, like it became 2D and you just swung your sword and there weren't really a physics change. Mm -hmm. It was just a perspective change. Mm -hmm. I remember Majora's Mask. Ask. Uh, it's like a underwater like factory thing that you're in and it was a huge roadblock for me and i remember like coming home to w- from work and being like oh yeah i get to play majora's mask tonight and then remembering like oh, i'm halfway through the the water temple and it was like or the, <laughs> the water <laughs> yeah the water dungeon and it's like ah, See, i don't I, know if i want to do this i actually liked um the underwater portions of uh, Mario 64. Yeah, yeah, they were they were great. I thought they were really well done. So, I mean, obviously there has to have been water levels before Mario. I mean, what, what was the first water level? Do we know? Technically, the first water level was in uh, a game called Polaris mm-hmm. for the Atari 2600, but it was a submarine game, so the entire game was nothing but water levels. Mm-hmm. But uh, there were there were games with like individual water levels to uh, Jungle Hunt, which was an arcade game. I actually with some really bad parallax scrolling that uh, I used to play a lot as a kid. Mm-hmm. They had a water level. Uh, Frogger Two had a water level, and uh, and there were other submarine games. Yeah, like, I think Sequest. Too. Yeah, that uh, Sequest. People Sequest might have been water. after uh, Super Mario Brothers. Uh, yeah, actually, it's probably. Just- so, as we've gotten away from this sort of 2D side-scrolling action underwater levels that are just thrown in there um, and into the modern era, with new technology, I mean, are we finding that they're a little less uh, intrusive? Personally, I think adding 3D mechanics exacerbates the problem mm-hmm. because, like, you've got, you know, your X-axis and your, your Y-axis. So everything kind of makes sense in your head if you understand, if you're, like, good at, like, positional memory, mm-hmm. like, map layouts, which I'm, like, I'm, like, really good at mm-hmm. that stuff, like, map layouts. And yeah, you're like known that. for it. I am. But, like, when you have a Z-axis, all of a sudden it's like, okay, I can go left, right, forward, backwards, up or down, mm-hmm. and it starts making everything really confusing because you're looking at a 2D screen, you know, trying to operate in that third dimension gets really confusing. Mm-hmm. You, you start having problems with like, okay, is that thing really small or is it just far away? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the PS1 era, the Twisted Metal formula was really getting popular and they even had games like Vigilante 8, which was a different sort of take on on Twisted Metal. He was like a Twisted Metal competitor. Single Track, the studio behind Twisted Metal 1 and 2, decided to take the popular Twisted Metal formula and put it underwater with underwater combat. Mm-hmm. And it was so fucking confusing to figure out where the enemy submarines were in relation to you. It was just a chore to play. It got decent reviews. It got decent stupid (laughs) (laughs) well nowadays you know with so many open world type games um 
I think it's less about like a water level um, in some regards and more about just being able to go underwater. My uh, only real experience of underwater areas in more modern games, uh, other than Skyrim, where you can just go underwater because mm-hmm. there's stuff there sometimes. Mm. Especially, especially if you're an Argonian. Sometimes. Especially if you're an Argonian. Especially if you have like the scuba mod. Yeah, or if you have a scuba mod. Or uh, I have one mod that uh, gives you an alteration perk that just you can breathe underwater when you hit that level of alteration. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, it was from The Last of Us, where the underwater bits felt really tedious and pointless because, oh, I have to go underwater and find a pallet so I can kind of float Ellie to the lever. This is dumb. Yeah. Uh, however... They didn't do it so often that I'm like, what the fuck is this? They did it just often enough that it really drove home Ellie can't swim for one particular moment later in the game where she falls in the water. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, so you were trying to make sure we understood this via the mechanics of the game. Are there any water levels that stand out in your mind that you like? Well, not for me. <laughs> Ask other people answer this question because I can, I can talk for hours about water levels that I like. I'm sure people wouldn't mind. I would love to hear some water levels that you particularly enjoyed, actually. I like the water level in Mother 3, the okay. greatest game of Hang all on. time. I'm calling a timeout. <laughs> no more Mother 3 on this show. I've had it about up to here with Mother 3. <laughs> oh, you know, Mother, we can they... stop hearing about Mother 3 when we stop hearing about Witcher 3. Which How about that? Which brings me to my next point. The Witcher 3. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mother 3 has the the best underwater breathing mechanic I've ever seen in a game. It's mm-hmm. that so that you can breathe underwater, you have to make out with a merman or a woman. <laughs> yep. So you have to like run around and looking for a mer person, grab them and kiss them, and then you can stay underwater for longer. It's so much fun. Mm-hmm. It's just this really weird, cool little world. And Mother 3 is kind of centered around one area, but you get to explore a lot of very different areas. Mm -hmm. And so it's a cool vibe because you feel like you always sort of have a home, but you're going up and having these weird adventures away from it. Mm -hmm. The other one I get really into is the underwater facility in Dino Crisis 2. I'm not familiar with the one from Dino Crisis. Uh, It's an underwater facility and you have to like go in this facility underwater to try and find some equipment really quickly. And so most of the time you're just exploring through it in this scuba suit and nothing is really happening, but it's sort of this really weird atmosphere Mm -hmm. of unease. And so you're exploring and just as you start to get close, you see this huge dinosaur swim up like (laughs) right over you and the mouth is dead. It's just terrifying. And you just see that one, and then suddenly you're thinking, like, what else is around me right now? And so, but you still have a ways to go to Mm -hmm. get that stuff, and so you have to get that stuff and get out of there while all those obstacles are around you, and, like, having the less familiar physics, really, the game benefits from that because it makes it a more stressful and intense situation where you're like, I really got to get this just right, and, Mm -hmm. like, something's going to eat me. Oh, it's so good. I loved the Dino Crisis games. They should make more of them. Do you remember uh, back in Episode 5, we talked about the game Submerged? (laughs) Do I? was called Submerged, yet there was, like, no underwater mechanics whatsoever. And one of the complaints that I heard about the game was like, oh, it would have been so much better if you could go underwater. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of funny that there's that idea, and then simultaneously there's the idea that in the gaming community, like, underwater stuff is typically regarded as, as frustrating and not fun. Yeah. But the thing about Submerged... Like, if they had done an underwater thing, it would have taken away one of the primary problems with underwater levels, because Submerged was all about the exploration. You were never in danger. So, so what that the physics are different? You're not going to accidentally jump onto spikes. You're not going to have to try to dodge enemies coming at you far quicker than you can move, Mm -hmm. etc., etc. So, Submerged legitimately would have been better with underwater mechanics because it would have given you more area to explore. Mm-hmm. And it would have given you a different way to explore. I think if uh, if Submerged did go underwater, shit would have got really fucking dark. Mm-hmm. Shit would have well, got real. Well, they had, uh, in their concept art, they had some underwater stuff and it looked super creepy. Mm-hmm. Thinking about it now, what's coming to mind is Dead Space. And I would say it's almost like they replaced the underwater level with the outer space level, which is basically <laughs> the same thing. You're fucking slow. You can't breathe. Yeah, you've got to, like, find those, like, ventilation things or whatever and, like, refill your air. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's stupid. Really stupid. My favorite game 
that has an underwater, not only an underwater level, but literally takes place entirely almost underwater, is Bioshock. Yeah, I love Bioshock. If only because it's completely underwater, but you're not trudging around in wet trousers and... <laughs> you do you do go out in the water in Bioshock too? A little bit, yeah. Although, ah, I've, always, I've come to dislike the water on the screen effect. Yeah. You know, you walk under some water dropping and all of a sudden the screen is kind of... I mean, it makes a little sense, I guess, in a first person perspective. But like when you're f- watching Geralt boat across the <laughs> right. vast expanse of water and it's flashing on the screen, it's like... That that breaks me out of the immersion. Am I watching this the whole time and I'm right. not Geralt? You know, <laughs> like right. You're the cameraman. I'm the cam. I'm the asshole who's just along for the ride. Right. That kind of stuff takes you out of the immersion because now you're not paying attention to what's on the screen. You're mm-hmm. paying attention to the water droplets, and you're like, "What the fuck's happening here?" Right. It, you think you could lend me a hand here? Like, I'm just the camera guy, man. Sorry, dude. I, <laughs> I'm just floating on a cloud. You're gonna, right? you're gonna have fucking... to kill this giant squid by yourself. <laughs> yeah. I really like games too, like Bioshock, that aren't really about underwater levels mm-hmm. but make things underwater and use that to make the game more interesting mm-hmm. there were several games like that i mean shadow of the colossus I think. yeah it had, there's the water colossi yeah shadow so. of the colossus is on my list of best goddamn games ever that i really need to play for longer than an hour I like mm. I've I've played like an hour or so of Shadow of the Colossus. Beautiful game, mechanics are great. Total. Total. To to date. To date. Oh. How how do you put that game down after an hour? How do you never go back to it? That's my question. How many times do I have to say I have ADHD Even before you so. figure out that this actually impacts my life in a negative way? I will and never believe you. And one of those ways <laughs> is that I got distracted and then never picked up Shadow of the Colossus again. <laughs> That's a shame. I picked it. I picked it back up, thinking like, "Oh, I've I've done everything. I've been everywhere. Like I've killed every colossus. Yada yada yada." And I went back to it, and then um, started doing some of the time trial stuff. And so it's like you are given a challenge where it's like you've got five minutes to, yeah. to beat this colossus. It's tricky. Uh, you, you're forced to really think on your feet and mm-hmm. to think quickly and to think like, okay. You know, typically I just climb the Colossus and stab it, and then I can hang on for 20 minutes and, you know, stab it again eventually, and it can be this huge epic thing. But Mm -hmm. now you're like, okay, what other skills do I have? What other, you know, what other tools are available to me? Like, how can I beat this thing faster? Mm -hmm. And so you're really forced to be a lot more resourceful than you are in the the main game. Mm -hmm. And it was like... It was kind of a game changer for me, and I went back and you know started started playing around with that stuff, and it was so much fun. Yeah. So now, when I had mentioned Bioshock, I was kind of being a little tongue in cheek because it does take place underwater. But I'm gonna say that there probably are wet trousers, and I'm sure there Bioshock. are. Well, you, I'm sure you, there you, are. You but. crash your plane into the water, and then you swim into the monument. So probably your pants are wet the whole time. You know, realistically, you're running around pretty much like any other game. But have there been games that have taken place completely underwater that have avoided this sort of annoying aspect of underwater levels? You like the Echo the Dolphin games, right, Josh? Echo the Dolphin got around a lot of those problems. Uh, you still did have the thing where you had to go up for air, mm-hmm. but they had they gave you a lot of different ways to get air. There was a lot of, you know, caverns with little pockets of air and stuff, and so we were constantly like trying to find that stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, since the entire game was set underwater and you're playing as a dolphin, you didn't have the problem of this mechanics going nowhere. It's like, you know, learning the underwater mechanics is learning the entire set of mechanics that you're going to need for the entire game. And so it didn't feel so like it came out of left field. It was just like, this is how you play the game. Like, mm-hmm. here's your mechanics and you're underwater. Mm-hmm. Underwater levels I did like. Uh, Donkey Kong Country series. Because by and large, uh, they weren't really changing the physics on you. Like, it, you were swimming instead of jumping, but you were still moving just as fast as you move on land. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I didn't feel, and like, you didn't have that, oh, you have to go up for breath thing. So I never felt like it was forcing me to be unprepared. Mm-hmm. 
And also, there were enough sporadic underwater levels, you know, like in all of the level areas, there was, you know, at least one that you were underwater, if not a couple. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you were still using the mechanics throughout the game instead of, you know, just for this one small section. Like, okay, I can get through this. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not making me feel like I'm a complete idiot while I'm trying to play this game. So see, that proves that the key to making a good underwater level is to just be scientifically inaccurate. Because, I mean, gorillas can't even swim. And not only can gorillas not swim, they, they can't float either because no, of their body density. No, they, they, they don't like being around water at all, which I actually learned from the seventh Narnia book. Well, unless it's mist. <laughs> It See, took a I minute. never played Mist, so. No, Gorilla's in the Mist. I think that would be right after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I think going forward, um, to sort of look at some underwater games that are kind of coming out, you know, I wouldn't say, obviously, No Man's Sky um, title alone suggests it doesn't take place entirely underwater, but it does look like there are some interesting aspects where you can explore underwater uh, life in games like that and and there's a game called abzu coming out it's made by uh somebody who actually worked on journey oh really uh, so it's really an underwater exploration game Mm -hmm. it's really visually cool looking just it's one of those games where i can just watch the first trailer over and over Mm -hmm. because it looks so cool and like it's very very journey-esque i mean if you play journey and you saw it even without knowing i'm sure you'd make that connection in your brain and it's really just swimming underwater and exploring and maybe you'll have obstacles you have to avoid but it's just visually beautiful and yeah i'm looking at a game called classroom aquatic oh my god i want that game so bad (laughs) it's uh for the oculus rift yeah the description of it completely threw me off i'm sure that's what you were looking at me like why is he reacting like that uh (laughs) a uh uh trivia slash stealth game um what the hell does that mean you have to stealthily look up the <laughs> answers to the questions without your teacher catching you're getting you, caught your yeah. dolphin teacher catching you excellent there's a, a game coming out called uh tangiers mm-hmm. it's sort of a horror stealth art game and uh if you play violently like if you kill enemies instead of sneaking around them the water levels will start to rise so the if you play violently enough it'll you'll be underwater i mean dishonored had something similar with the rats like the yeah. more people you killed the worse the the rat plague got and so if you're like running around you know, in like the uh, uh, the lower parts of the level, like it would just be swarming with rats. I thought it was really clever. No, it is. It's mm-hmm. and, and like more that. infected, too. Is also right. I mean, don't the rats infect people and make them? If there's just a few rats, they'll just run away from you. But mm-hmm. if they're in a swarm, they'll mm-hmm. like start chewing at your legs and mm-hmm. and. Uh, if there's enough, they can just kill you. Like yeah. you'll be you'll be running, and a big swarm of rats comes and just kills you. Yeah, that's but at the true. same at the same time, that you've got true. the. Uh, you can earn the possession skill, mm-hmm. and so you can like use rats to your advantage if you possess a rat, and mm-hmm. then you know inhabit the body of a rat, and then go run around as a rat for a while. Mm-hmm. Like th- then the rat skill becomes, or the the rat plague becomes more useful to you. Which has nothing to do with water, but you know it's a thing you can do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you can also uh, use your possession skill on fish. <laughs> okay, and, and so if you're. Uh, you know, there's there's like this building you're trying to get into and it's really well guarded and there's like a little sewage, like a drainage pipe, a drainage ditch thing that goes under the building. You could possess a fish and then swim under the building and then use that as a way to get inside. Okay. Yeah. Got to really use your knowledge and your noggin on that one <laughs> to, to unravel that puzzle. It's kind of... I don't know how to frame this, but there are educational water exploration games. And... There are. There are. There are a lot of them. They're really, there have been for a long time, I feel like. Actually, there's one uh, I played a lot as a kid called Odell Lake. Hmm. And uh, you just played as different fish swimming through the w- river and you had to figure out like which fish would try to eat you and which fish you could eat. Yeah, I think I may have played that. That's actually kind of a nifty game idea. Yeah, but I mean, like, you you learn a lot about, like, the lake life and mm-hmm. how it works. And uh, 
Was there a bird of prey that would come down? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so you couldn't swim too close to the surface because yeah. there were, you could <laughs> be eaten by a bird, but only for certain types of fish. Mm -hmm. So no, I mean, it, it was educational. It was super fun. It was actually really creepy because the sound effects were so weird. Mm -hmm. So like sometimes a fish would eat you and you'd hear like this horrible sound. And I played it at school. So I had like a big <laughs> headphones <Yeah>. on. <laughs> so all of a sudden you'd hear like this horrible death sound and you'd like fall out of your chair in front of all your classmates. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, I've seen I've seen Mandy play uh, Five Nights at Freddy's in a coffee shop, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's hilarious because she's wearing headphones and nobody knows what she's doing, and all of a sudden she's like, "Yep!" <laughs> Everyone's like, "What?" What's I played Five doing? Nights at Freddy's on a plane once, <laughs> oh, God. like sitting next to some guy who looks so confused. <laughs> That's the best possible place to play Five Nights at Freddy's. Uh, there's the there's turbulence, and I was scared, so I decided to play Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> there were some really good PS3 ones, like Aquanauts Holiday, and like mm -hmm. all these games are swimming around in the water and like looking at fish and learning about ocean life or lake life or whatever. And I mean, it's a really good format for underwater games and they're yeah. super chill and super fun. And like, I wish they'd make more of these games because I just really like swimming around and mm -hmm. relaxing and appreciating being underwater. Yeah, and I think, you know, just in general without, we would, I think we, we would be uh, remiss if we didn't at least mention Seaman. Yeah. In an underwater uh, exploration uh, episode, but was... only a mention. I don't want to get into any details. Oh, my favorite Sea Man. My favorite <laughs> thing about Sea Man is uh, the game Deadly Premonition. Okay. When Suri65, who created Deadly Premonition, was looking for the voice actor for the main character, Francis York, he deliberately sought out the voice actor for Seaman. Really? He's like, who, who did the voice of Seaman? Get that guy. And I mean, it's perfect. It's perfect. Like, there could not be a better voice actor for York in Deadly yeah. Premonition. Oh, yeah, York. So he knew what he was doing, but he's like, that guy who played, like, the sort of weird bored fish... That I want him to sound like a weird that, bored fish. That would that would stare at you, mm -hmm. eye contact, while it was fucking another fish. Yeah, the whole time, <laughs> making eye contact with you. That yeah. was such a bizarre ass. You know, game. I, I love the Dreamcast, but I I didn't have Sea Man. Mm. I didn't either. I, I remember it obviously, but uh, no, I was too creeped out. On those sites that have that are basically just gaming listicle sites, whenever they have like a weirdest games of all time, like the stock foot, the stock image that they always use is just the picture of C Man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, what a good game! Yeah, it's what Hey You Pikachu is expiring to be. Huh. <laughs> Not really, I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know what? If Hey You Pikachu had aspired to be Seaman, it might have been a fun game. I, I, I think Hey You Pikachu predates Seaman. <laughs> Fair enough. It's just because they both were games from the late 90s, early 2000s that used voice control. Mm -hmm. So I think that brings us full circle for our uh, water, underwater level exploration episode. Um, you know, it's one of those things that if you played a game, you've probably encountered a level that has water in it, and perhaps you're underneath water in that level. They can be frustrating, they can be entertaining, they can be just a nice change of pace. Some games uh, take place entirely underwater and throw caution to the wind, and maybe they don't garner uh, Rev's purchase on those games because he staunchly dislikes underwater level games outside of Donkey Kong games. But uh, hey, you know what? They're bold, and I give them credit for that. Given the chance, I would avoid water probably under every circumstance. But when I'm Geralt, you know, I, I feel the strength of him. And I can go underwater with my whale sauce and I can... <laughs> <laughs> whale sauce! <laughs> spend, <laughs> spend a little bit more time underwater enjoying uh, my time with him and... Uh, you really, you really bond in those underwater moments. You, you do. You and Geralt. Are I do. We do. Become yeah. one. We got our fish sauce and uh, a whale juice, and we're just chilling. <laughs> you know, I think we're adults. Okay, what we do with ourselves underwater is our own business. <laughs> Along with whale juice. <laughs> Along with whale juice. Um, but so yeah, I mean, you know, water levels can be cool. They can be frustrating. Um, games can sort of find avenues. Uh, within which to explore terrifying things. I, I'm, I don't want to die underwater, you know, and playing games where that's a possibility really shakes me up to my core. I will say this, and I will leave you with this. 
The Crow was absolutely my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> If there was more water in the curl, there might be less fire. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is true. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you out there on the wide open, vast expanses of the world that has water in it. the like I just said like there are some movies and Josh like heard it as like there are a lot and he just kept bugging me he's like what else what yeah. else so I like felt really pressured to be judgmental about people and like I was in public and there was like a guy right behind me and he seemed like annoyed so I probably said a movie that he liked <laughs>